My name is Gareth Fry, and I'm an assistant professor of graphic design at Utah Valley University. The subject of my presentation is transforming graphic design and elevating human lives. Some of the ads created around the turn of the 20th century seem pretty quirky when judged by today's standards. Style aside, I think this is partly because they tended to directly focus on the functional and utilitarian value of products. For example, this rather tame ad for Freeman's egg powder simply says that you can use it for cakes, pancakes, plum puddings and Yorkshire puddings. Beecham's pills are a wonderful medicine for bilious and nervous disorders. And the Densmore typewriter has the lightest key touch, greatest speed and most convenient paper feed. But some are extra entertaining because the products themselves are more than a little strange. Dr. Scott's electric toothbrush is permanently charged with an electromagnetic current which invigorates and vitalizes the teeth and gums. The Star asbestos pad from Kearney Manufacturing Company is designed to protect your dining table from damage by heat and moisture but obviously ignores the health and well-being of your guests. And among other products, the Elberfeld company promoted heroin as the sedative for coughs. Maybe it's no surprise then that sales of such products on the back end often fell short of the rate and volume of mass production on the front end. As such, the idea to make them seem more enticing soon emerged. And that's where marketers like Edward Bernays and Ernest Dichter came into the picture. Their solution was to create campaigns that linked ordinary products such as Coke, shaving cream and ketchup with highly desirable emotional benefits, including friendliness, popularity and romantic allurement. The copy on this one, for example, says Everybody knows that friendliness is speaking when somebody says, have a Coke. Popular faces are shaved with Barbasol. And Heinz ketchup beckons a man. Designers were also enlisted to help with this bit of theater. And in short shrift, design as a whole was co-opted by commercial industry. As the system evolved over time, an iron link was forged between designers and their clients. And a century later, we find essentially the same system still in place today. The long-term effect this has had on perceptions, as succinctly described in both the First Things First Manifesto 2000 and a Manifesto 2020 edition, is that many graphic designers have now let it become, in large measure, what graphic designers do. This, in turn, is how the world perceives design. So on all sides, everyone more or less sees graphic design as being inextricably linked with the role of serving industry. But even though this is a little pitiful, I have to be honest and say that at least the system more or less works. Designers generally enjoy what they do, Clients are appreciative of the services they provide. And for the most part, consumers respond to the things they make. And despite the drive in industry to make as much money as possible, at least many of the things designers help to promote are relatively useful. I think this is partly why, as John Berger states, we accept the total system of publicity images as we accept an element of climate. It's just always there and always part of our day-to-day -day experience. But in the same way that we're occasionally too hot or too cold or too wet or too parched, we also experience various negative impacts from this system that we either don't notice or don't directly connect with the various promotions we're used to seeing. This includes anxiety caused by the visual clutter and overstimulation we encounter in our everyday environments, including on social media. 
Poor health and illness caused by the consumption of harmful products such as tobacco and junk food. And dissatisfaction caused by the acquisition of consumer goods that, in reality, are unable to solve life's vexatious problems and make us as happy as we are promised they can. I think it would be fair to say then that most graphic design is actually a mixed bag of both positive and negative effects. Let's break this down a bit by looking at a way to assess or measure graphic design output. For every piece of design that is made, there are four aspects that comprise its whole soul, if you will. They are subject value, meaning whether the product, service or message is intrinsically beneficial or harmful. Aesthetics, meaning whether the execution of the design is masterful or mindless. This is obviously very subjective and I intentionally avoided using terms like beautiful and ugly for that very reason, but it's still something we can try to evaluate. Messaging mode, meaning whether the method of communication is manifestly truthful or deceitful. And consequential effects, meaning whether or not the short and long-term impacts of the output on physical, mental and emotional health and human behaviours are empowering or destructive. These, as I said, are the aspects of every design that as a whole comprise its overall virtue or value. Let's look at a couple of examples. The first one is the Dig for Victory poster created by the British Ministry of Information in 1941. It was intended to encourage the British people to support the war effort by being self-sufficient and to eat healthy foods like homegrown vegetables. My assessment of this design is that the message was intrinsically beneficial. The execution of the design, though simple, was relatively masterful. The method of communication was truthful. And the impacts of the output were definitely empowering during several years of wartime rationing. The second example is a Camel cigarette ad created at a similar time in 1946. As you can see, the intention of the ad is to make it appear that camel cigarettes are safe to smoke because doctors smoke them. My assessment of this design is that the product is intrinsically harmful. The execution of the design, to be fair, is relatively masterful. The method of the communication is blatantly deceitful. And it's difficult to overstate how destructive this and many other campaigns like it have been to the health and lives of millions of people spanning many decades. As you think about the kind of work you do, you might begin to see that it's challenging for designers to make everything they produce beneficial, masterful, truthful, and I mean 100% truthful, and uplifting, especially when you're working on other people's stuff. This isn't to say that designers are always miserably failing, but maybe we're a little too content with relatively modest goals. Maybe we're simply content with outcomes like earning a living and providing for ourselves and our families, learning new skills and creating portfolio-worthy or perhaps even award-winning work. Making our clients happy and helping them to be successful. That doesn't describe all design though. Design is also sometimes focused on arguably higher aims such as providing people with helpful products and useful tools, doing pro bono work for organizations that need a helping hand, and using our creativity for advocate for various causes. But even though I think most of the design in those categories would probably measure a little higher, with at least two or three out of the four aspects of design I mentioned, I think there's still a deeper level that could more completely define the overall vision and purpose of graphic design 
and make the output we create more elevating for the people who consume it. This has a flavor of idealism to it, but the goal I'm describing is to rest all of our work on the very bedrock of our humanity by using our time and talents to support the literal fulfillment of fundamental human needs. This approach would challenge the status quo because the focus would shift away from perpetuating the existing time-honored system to reimagining a new way, ranging from basic physical needs to the highest need to become everything that one is capable of becoming. Designers could, through their work, aim to help people to eat and live healthily, promote peace and safety, foster strong relationships within families and circles of friends, promote a sense of self-respect that also garners respect from others, and encourage the lifelong pursuit and accomplishment of personal growth and fulfillment. As you look at these aims though, you might feel that some of the projects designers typically work on don't really fit any of them very clearly. For example, you might be able to see a direct connection between items such as food and drink with the first aim to help people to eat healthily, but struggle to see what would help to promote a sense of self-respect. I think that just means we have to look at some projects in a more general way. Perhaps, for example, we need to consider whether or not they reduce or add to the clutter in our physical and digital environments, which can either enhance or diminish an overall sense of peace and safety. Perhaps we need to consider whether or not they discourage or encourage consumerism and materialism, which can either foster strong relationships or diminish them. To give you an example of such a project, let me tell you about a branding program I recently worked on. It was a project for a friend who wanted me to help him launch a new cosmetics company. My first reaction was to tell him no because I had a hard time seeing how encouraging people to buy and use cosmetics could help them to fulfill their fundamental needs. I mean, I still mostly feel that way, but I also saw an opportunity to do something positive, and so I told him I would help on the condition that we implement a no Photoshop policy. This meant that we would use the editing tool to make necessary color and exposure corrections, but not to hide natural blemishes, skin textures, and hairlines. Instead of creating images like this, we would create images that are more like this. The underlying thinking was that in a world rife with misleading advertising and its corollary emotional fallout, this approach would hopefully help to create reasonable expectations of the products and to support, rather than undermine, a healthy self-image. In turn, this would hopefully promote a sense of self-respect and possibly even encourage personal growth and fulfillment. This isn't exactly a perfect example because you could certainly argue that many women would still kill for the youthful looks of the woman on the right. But maybe that's part of the point. Shifting to a focus on human needs is going to take time, and it'll be quite a stretch for most designers, clients, and users alike. And so in the case of this branding project, I felt that the no Photoshop policy was quite a satisfying victory. The key, I think, is to believe that everyone can do something. In my very first role as a designer almost 30 years ago, I worked for renowned author Stephen Covey, who had written several business management and leadership bestsellers, and had launched a successful business training organization. A friend of mine in England, who was a fan of his writing, was eager to get a signed copy of his newest book, and so I agreed to obtain one for her. I bought the book, left it with Covey's assistant, and returned a few days later to collect it. To my surprise, though, he only wrote three words in addition to his name and the name of the person he was signing the book for. He simply wrote a trim tab. At first I was a little disappointed and thought my friend might feel similarly. But after I investigated the meaning of his comment, 
I could see the wisdom in his note. It turns out he was quoting Buckminster Fuller, who, in a 1972 magazine interview, described what a trim tab is, what it can do, and how we can be like one. Fuller explained that a trim tab is a small section at the edge of a ship's rudder that takes almost no effort at all to move, but when it is turned, it builds a low pressure that pulls the rudder around and, in turn, the entire ship. His point, and that of Covey's, was that we can all build low pressure in areas in which we hope for change, and then wait patiently for things to happen with the belief that there is great power in doing little things that count. This patient but deliberate approach can be effectively implemented in three key areas. Your personal work, by creating meaningful, thoughtful projects that support the fulfillment of various human needs. Your client work by either choosing projects that support the fulfillment of human needs or by trying to persuade your clients to make one or two improvements to projects that would otherwise leave much to be desired. And if you teach design, by helping your students to understand that graphic design need not be limited to the realm of commercial work and that they too can use design in powerful ways to support the fulfillment of human needs. Let's make this the new reality for what designers do and put in place a new model for future generations of creatives that they will be grateful to inherit.